Okay, uh, let's get started. Uh, uh, today's, uh, today's topic and also for uh, Thursday as well is the foreign tax credit mechanism. And uh, this is one of the major pieces that uh, is in the outbound area. Other major pieces, of course, we'll see your subpart F, uh, the guilty rules that we're going to see, uh, and a few other areas. But the foreign tax credit is one major piece, and its significance will be seen in other areas as we get into it. There's a lot of parts uh, to the foreign tax credit, and we'll attempt to take them one by one. But first, we need to, of course, set the stage and try to say, well, you know, what is it? Why is it there? Why do we, uh, why do we care about it? Uh, why does not only the United States have this kind of thing in its law, but pretty much the same thing as in uh, the tax systems of pretty much every other country that I've ever uh, seen or, or worked within. So uh, this is, uh, uh, this is uh, and it, it just a very important and ubiquitous uh, area. Okay, if we start off with our usual blank page, and if we draw our usual line, uh, which is intended to be a boundary, and if we put what we hope is a human being up on top, uh, and if we say that this is the U.S. and we say that this is country A, is that individual potentially subject to more than one country's tax. Let's assume that this individual is a citizen. Uh, and being a U.S. citizen makes him a U.S. taxpayer. Uh, how do we know? Uh, if I remember correctly, we'll find uh, a definition in Section 7701, which includes a citizen as a U.S. person uh, with respect to uh, the income tax system. So uh, that's that's pretty basic. Now, uh, that uh, individual up there could be, for example, myself. I had the good fortune to work in a number of countries around the world. And in each country that I was in, uh, do you think the local government wanted to tax me? Yeah, you can uh, bet your bippy, so to speak. I don't know whether that's still an expression uh, today, but yes, it's a good solid bet that each government of the country that I was in wanted to tax me. Now, being a U.S. citizen, born in a hospital in Seattle uh, a few years ago, I know that I'm going to be taxed by the United States, no matter where I reside in this world, okay, that other country wants to tax me. So I'm subject to the tax of two countries. And if I do business travel, for example, in a number of other countries, maybe there's other countries that want to tax me as well. So an individual can be subject uh, to some taxation in country A and, of course, some taxation back in the home country. So we have the possibility of uh, multiple taxation. What's the top U.S. rate nowadays? 37? 37 sounds pretty good. And I suppose you could also add on, what is it, 3.8% for uh, certain types of income net, for the net, net investment uh, tax. So get pretty high. Do you think other countries also have high tax rates on individuals? Yeah, they do. So cumulatively, 
if there's no relief for that dreaded word double taxation, uh, the rates can get very, very high. So it's important. It's important to individuals. What about, uh, what about a company? We'll draw the same picture, but we'll, of course, uh, make it a U.S. Uh, corporation, which we'll call X, and here's country A. What about X? Can X be subject to the tax of more than one country? If it's incorporated within the United States, taxable on worldwide income, and uh, X might have might have income, uh, business income from having a uh, having an office in another country. Might have dividend income, interest income, royalties, you know, uh, other types of uh, income. And those other countries, they want to extract their pound of flesh. They want to grab their piece. So again, corporations can have. Uh, tax uh, can have the same income taxed by more than one country. So, again, uh, while maybe on the corporate side the tax rates are a bit lower, in other words, the uh, tax rate now in the United States is 21 percent, and a lot of other countries have lowered their rates over the past few decades. Uh, so that maybe it's not as bad as for individuals, but you still have the same potential for double taxation, more than one country grabbing tax out of the same item of income. So the point is, unless we have a mechanism to prevent double taxation, the economic effect of it, then there's sort of a discouragement of individuals to uh, spend time working overseas. And there's also a discouragement for corporations to go and do business in other countries. Now, is it from a policy standpoint, should our tax system discourage individuals from going overseas? discourage corporations from conducting business overseas? It really shouldn't. And there's a mentality uh, somewhere in the, uh, in the outline, I probably refer to it as a uh, sort of a religious belief, uh, that Congress believes that these things should be neutral. The tax system should not either encourage or discourage uh, individuals or corporations from uh, conducting business in the way that makes sense to them for legal and other, you know, illegal and non-tax factors. Tax should not be a motivation one way or the other. Tax should be neutral. Now that's part of the religion. That's part of what we see sometimes in some of these provisions, is that what works out in practice? Probably not. But it's part of why some of these things are there. So again, keeping in the back of your mind that this is a policy goal, and it's part of what Congress is trying to create in terms of the tax system, uh, some of this stuff will make more sense. Okay, so just to give a very small example, a very simple example of you know how some simple numbers can work out if there is not a mechanism for uh, relieving double taxation. Uh, notice we assume you know a hundred of pre-tax income. We assume that country B uh, has uh, imposed a 25 tax, leaving 75. 
Now, here we're assuming there's a deduction for the tax. There's no foreign tax credit, which is this important mechanism. Uh, net taxable income, 75. U.S. tax rate, 21%. Gives a tax of 15.75. So if we then add the two together, the U.S. tax and the country B tax, we get a total of 40.75. And that means we have an effective tax rate of over 40%. Now, that's one of these terrible answers. Uh, you know, you want to avoid things like this. So, uh, the, you know, having a mechanism that really relieves double taxation is important. Now, here we've changed the situation and we've said, okay, same numbers, but we have a tax credit, a foreign tax credit in place. And uh, we, of course, uh, come down and eventually come to an effective tax rate of 25. Why 25? Uh, uh, why shouldn't it be 21? Because the U.S. rate is 21. Well, we said the foreign rate was 25. The U.S. rate is 21. The, me the, the foreign tax credit mechanism leaves the taxpayer economically bearing the higher of the two country rates. If the foreign rate is higher than the U.S. rate, then that foreign rate is the economic cost of the taxpayer. If on the other hand, uh, I think I have uh, an example, okay, an example of a lower foreign tax uh, uh, where the foreign tax is only 10%, then the measure, the economic cost of the taxpayer, ends up being the U.S. rate because it's higher. So, important concept. If the foreign tax credit works as intended, the economic cost is the higher of the U.S. rate or the foreign rate. This is theoretically the way it is supposed to work necessarily work out that way. No, there's a whole bunch of various things that can come into this in real life that cause these things to change. But this is the basic concept and what it's meant to uh, achieve. In these drawings that I had put up, uh, we had X up there and country A. Country A is normally going to only impose tax on income of X, which is actually sourced in country A, or results from X conducting business in country A. In other words, there's something that allows uh, A to, to grab that. If you think back to your T515, uh, those of you who took it, uh, which was the inbound course. The U.S., you know, going in the opposite direction of this chart, the U.S. has the ability to take a piece of any U.S. source income or any effectively connected income, effectively connected with the U.S. trade or business. Well, it's the same thing generally in reverse. What you learned in T515 is pretty much the same everywhere else in the world. So the point is that whatever income A wants to tax, it's there because it's sourced there or it results from business activity there. Now, the point is that country A, in a manner of speaking, has the first right to tax, the first bite at the apple. Whatever the income is that's within their, uh, their scope of taxation, they get a piece of that. They have first claim. So the U.S., through this foreign tax credit mechanism, is essentially recognizing that first claim 
and saying, in general, uh, we will not tax to the extent that you have exercised that first claim. So the U.S. is recognizing that that other country has the right and through the foreign tax credit, credit mechanism will not, uh, will not impose uh, tax to the extent that the other country has exercised that. So that's uh, somewhat what I mean by saying the host or source country has the first right to tax. And as uh, talked about and shown in the examples, the U.S. reduces its tax to the extent of tax imposed by the country of source. Uh, and uh, we haven't gotten into it yet, but uh, that subject, the amount of credit that's given is subject to a limitation. We'll get into that limitation later and why it's there. Okay, and again, uh, uh, the uh, fourth point there, the total combined tax of the two countries is equal to the higher uh, of the tax of the, uh, uh, the U.S. or the other country. So those are I think the uh, important things to take away so far. <clears throat>